Banal pathologies of the, of the stomach, the first one is acute gastritis. So gastritis means inflammation of the stomach, and this inflammation is going to lead to mucosal injury. And this inflammation arises from an imbalance between the mucosal defense and the acidic load. So if you have inflammation and mucosal injury, you can either get an erosion or an ulcer. And do you remember the difference between the two? So an erosion was involvement of only the mucosal layer and an ulcer was penetration or damage to the, mo to the stomach lining beyond the mucosal layer. So now let's talk about mucosal defenses now. There's a couple things that we, we have that prevent the acid in our stomach from damaging it, including the mucus layer that lines our stomach, the bicarbonate, which neutralizes the H+, and finally, blood supply, which provides nutrients and oxygen to our stomach lining. So now let's talk about etiologies. How can we get an imbalance between mucosal defenses and acidic load? Well, first of all, if you use too much NSAIDs, if you have chronic NSAID use, well, NSAIDs decrease prostaglandin E2. And if you decrease that, prostaglandin E2 is super important. It pretty much is involved in all these gastric defense functions. It maintains the mucus barrier. It helps with blood flow to the stomach, and it decreases H plus secretion. So you lose all of that. So you have, you're very much at risk for mucosal injury. The next one is burns. So this is called a curling ulcer. Why would a burn lead to an imbalance between mucosal defenses and acidic load leading to mucosal injury? Well, when it burns, what you do is you, you, you basically get hypovolemia. You get massive evaporation because you lose that skin barrier. So you, you basically lose a lot of fluid. So if you have massive hypovolemia, then what's going to happen? What part of your gastric defense is going to be affected? It's going to be the blood supply. So you have decreased blood supply, and so there's decreased nutrients, decreased oxygen. You get mucosal injury. So that's a curling ulcer. Just remember, curling can burn you. Curling, uh, curling iron can burn you. Next one is the brain injury, aka Cushing ulcer. And brain injury, what's going to happen is it's going to increase vagal stimulation. Why would that be a problem? What does vagal stimulation do to the stomach? Do you remember? Where vagal stimulation, when rest and digest, increases H plus production through a, uh, acetylcholine. So it increased H plus production, causes imbalance between mucosal defense and acidic load, leading to um, acute gastritis. Finally, we have heavy alcohol use, and that's due to direct damage to the mucosal barrier. So, symptoms. What some symptoms can you get from acute gastritis? Pretty general, pretty easy. Pain, discomfort, nausea, vomiting, very general symptoms. So the key thing here to know is the etiologies. The other thing to know is that you can have acute gastrointestinal bleeding if your ulcers lead to damage of the gastric blood vessels. And we'll talk about more about that later with the um, in the peptic ulcer disease section in a few minutes. So next is chronic gastritis. Chronic gastritis is obviously going to tell us chronic inflammation, and you can get chronic inflammation from either an autoimmune problem or an H. pylori infection. And note that H. pylori is a much more common cause of chronic gastritis. So this is chronic inflammation from these problems. You don't get chronic inflammation from these problems above. Those are acute inflammation, okay? So let's talk about H. pylori mediated gastritis now. H. pylori causes problems because it increases H plus production and it decreases mucus pr um, production. So H. pylori, let's see, call it an infection here. So now you have more H plus, increased H plus, you have decreased mucus, so now you can get mucosal injury. And your infection can spread to the rest of the stomach. And so when you have this infection, you have increased risk of a peptic ulcer disease, which we'll talk about in a second, and a malt lymphoma. That's the mucus-associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma. The way you treat this is you treat this with triple therapy. So triple therapy consists of a PPI, clarithromycin, and amoxicillin. PPI is a protein pump inhibitor, decreases H plus production, and then you have these two antibiotics to help eradicate H. pylori. With this treatment, we can erase all the complications, all the problems that H. pylori chronic gastritis causes. 
you can resolve the the ulcer that the gastritis you can resolve intest reverse intestinal metaplasia as well as the malt lymphoma so the next one is the autoimmune mediated chronic gastritis and what is this what what is going on autoimmune so that means you have autoantibodies to the parietal cells that cause the destruction of both parietal cells and intrinsic factor that is produced. So first of all, if you lose intrinsic factor, what happens? Remember, what, what do we talk about? You can get pernicious anemia, that was the megaloblastic anemia arising from vitamin B12 deficiency because you need uh, intrinsic factor to carry vitamin B12 to the ileum. And again, this is easy. This affects the body and fundus of the stomach because this is the problem. That it's where the, the parietal cells are getting are, are, are located. So that's where you get the inflammation due to the destruction from autoimmune antibodies. So now we've talked about acute and both chronic acute and chronic inflammation. So now let's talk about peptic ulcer disease. This is the, a disease characterized by recurrent ulcerations that involve the stomach or duodenum. So recurrent ulcerations here is the key. It's usually related to chronic gastritis resulting from H. pylori infection. We talked all about that. How H. pylori leads to um, too much acid secretion, to um, poor mucosal defense, and then you can get ulcerations of the gastric lining. Now, we're going to differentiate into gastric and duodenal ulcers. And there's actually, we said that H. pylori is the most common cause. Uh, additional causes for gastric ulcers, or NSAIDs, which we, which we talked about, where NSAIDs were important because they basically decrease all the stomach defenses. Then we have zollinger ellinger syndrome for duodenal ulcers. zollinger ellison syndrome is basically caused by a gastrin secreting neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas. So it's a tumor in the pancreas that secretes a bunch of gastrin, which causes a lot of H plus production. So these are the two additional causes. Now pain, will pain be increased after eating or um, will it be better or worse after eating? That's the question. For a gastric ulcer, it will be better or worse after eating. Well, what happens when you eat in the stomach? Well, when you eat in the stomach, when we talked about that, where the cephalic gastric phases lead to H plus production, and now that now you're gonna have even more H plus, you're gonna have more irritation. So you get increased pain after eating with meals in a gastric ulcer. Now in the duodenum, what's gonna happen? What happens when you eat in the duodenum? When food get reaches the duodenum, what happens is that when we said all that all those nutrients like like fatty acids, lipids, get into the duodenum and they're going to trigger a release of bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is there to neutralize the H+, so you actually get neutralization of acid after you eat. So now you have relief of pain. So gastric ulcers increase pain, duodenal ulcers relief of pain with meals. And that's a very key distingui um, distinguishing factor between the two. So now risk of cancer. Are these associated with risk of cancer? For gastric ulcers, the answer is yes, there is a risk of cancer, associated risk of cancer. Duodenal ulcers, there is actually no associated risk of cancer. And the significance here is that if you see a gastric ulcer, you need to biopsy it. Because there's, again, there's a risk of cancer. You, want, you need to make sure there's no cancer going on. Duodenal ulcer, there's no need to biopsy because there's no increased risk of cancer. Finally, complications. We talked about this in the um, previous slide, but you can have risk of bleeding if your ulcers lead to damage of, of your uh, arteries lining the stomach then you can get rupture and a lot of bleeding so we said gastric ulcers like to be over here and so they can damage the left gastric artery the ulceration involves too much and damage of the left gastric artery in the duodenum if it's a posterior duodenal ulcer, then you can get rupture of the gastroduodenal artery, which is outlined here and in the blue here. As you can see, it runs behind the duodenum, so if you have a posterior duodenal ulcer, that can lead to damage of the gastroduodenal artery. The other thing that can happen is you can get perforation of the duodenum if you have an ulcer in the anterior duodenum. So that's it for our peptic ulcer diseases. Now we're going to switch off to another disease of the stomach. This is Menetriere disease probably butchering the name. This is also known as a protein-losing hypertrophic gastropathy. 
Why would I tell you such a long, long, confusing name? Because I tell you this because this name tells you everything you need to know about this problem, pretty much. It's protein losing. That's number one. That's problem number one. And you get hyper, it's hypertrophic. It's hypertrophy. So it's, that's how it's characterized. It's protein losing state because you're going to have ex, like too much mucus production and there's all this protein in the mucus. So you're producing all this mucus, spitting all it out, so you're losing protein. And that's because you have these hypertrophied mucosal folds, okay? And the last thing you need to know is that there's impaired acid production, and that's due to atrophy from the parietal cells. Where parietal cells are the ones that secrete that HCL. So what symptoms will you have? The, there's vague GI symptoms, okay? So this is, these are all GI problems, vague GI symptoms, pain, weight loss. The thing, the other symptom is the protein losing. If you lose protein, what happens? What happens in your blood vessels? What happens to your osmotic pressure? Osmotic pressure goes down, so what happens? Then water is going to go in to your vessels, and so you're going to get edema. Okay, decreased osmotic pressure leading to edema. The other thing to know is that there's increased risk of gastric cancer in this, in this disease. But again, the key, protein losing hypertrophic gastropathy is you have Hypertrophy of the gastric folds leading to excess mucus production. Mucus excess mucus production leads to losing a protein. And then losing a protein basically leads to edema and you also have all these other vague GI symptoms. So now let's talk about gastric cancer. Gastric cancer we can divide into two types. Similar to esophageal cancer, there's two types of gastric cancer. There's intestinal type and there's a diffuse signet ring type. So the intestinal type looks like peptic ulcers with raised margins. And this results from metaplasia. See, it's a gastric cancer, but it's intestinal type, so obviously something changed, so that's metaplasia. And it's most commonly found in the lesser curvature of the stomach. So the lesser curvature is, remember, this is the stomach here, the esophagus. This is the lesser curvature. It's smaller, smaller distance. It's the greater curvature. And this was, um, Again, I said results from metaplasia, hence the intestinal type. So metaplasia, what, is, what do we say causes metaplasia? And we said that inflammation causes metaplasia. So the risk factors for this disease are stuff that causes inflammation. So we talked about H. pylori already. Stuff in smoked foods. Nitrous amines in smoked foods cause inflammation. Smoking is always causing inflammation. Chronic gastritis all cause inflammation, causing metaplasia. Now we're going to switch off and look at the diffuse signet ring adenocarcinomas. We call it signet rings because that's what the cells look like. This is like, look, this is the thing, and this is the ring, this is the head of the ring. And this, you see signet rings in histology, as you see, and on gross exam, there's the stomach has a leathery appearance. It's called linitis plastica. Why does that happen? You can tell from the name. There's diffuse infiltration of the stomach um, by the signet ring cells. And this happens because signet ring cells lose the cell adhesion protein E cadherin. Right? Cadherin helps adhere, helps them stick together. If you lose it, they can spread out and you get diffuse inflammation, uh, infiltration in that stomach and it becomes like a leathery appearance. And so that's diffuse adenocarcinoma. And because it's not a metaplasia, it's not a metaplasia problem, there's no inflammation, it's not associated with the risk factors for the intestinal type. What clinical features will we experience? What patient experience? General GI symptoms. So weight loss, abdominal pain, early satiety. It doesn't help you much. Many other things can cause this. You can get anemia because cancer bleeds. Cancer has all these blood vessels that supply those growing cells and they can bleed and you can get anemia. Finally, you can see acanthosis nigricans or the lesser trilat sign. Acanthosis nigricans, I don't know if you remember this, this is that hyperpigmentation, darkening of the skin. It's velvety. You see it in cancers, or you can also see it in endocrine diseases like diabetes. The other thing you see is less of the trilla sign, which is the rapid appearance of many seborrheic keratoses, which is all these brown splotches on his back. Okay, That's the lesser trilla sign associated with gastric cancer. Now we're going to talk about lymph node and metastatic involvement. Gastric cancer goes to a very few, a, f a few very uh, characteristic places. There's the Verkau node, as metastasis to the left supraclavicular lymph node. 
okay it's on the left side it's right above the clavicle left supraclavicular lymph node this is often the very first clinical manifestation of gastric cancer the sister mary joseph node is different it's the peri umbilical metastasis and the way i remember this so mary and joseph they're the parents of jesus mary became pregnant and so that's what i think that um, peri umbilical metastasis is basically mary being pregnant with jesus apologize if i offended any catholics finally we have the kruckenberg tumor this is a bilateral ovarian metastasis and you this you get mucin producing signet ring cells so that's very characteristic massive production of mucin um, in, the ovary, in the ovaries due to this metastasis and that's a Kruckenberg tumor and so these are actually very characteristic uh, nodes you probably want to remember them so Verkal node left supraclavicular sister Mary Joseph node periumbilical Kruckenberg is the one that goes to bilateral ovaries so that is it for our gastric problems our stomach pathologies